Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Shri Tumidi, and I'm the product manager for UAA. And uh, I've been with Pivotal for three years, mostly managing uh, UAA, and also the proprietary identity service for Pivotal, which is the Pivotal single sign-on service. So let's get into the agenda for today. So this is by no means a UAA overview talk. We only have 30 minutes. And if I were to get into some kind of an overview, I think it would take upwards of an hour. So today, we are going to be focusing on uh, feature updates that uh, we have done in the past couple of months and a look at the 2017 roadmap and the major features that are planned for UAA. And uh, finally, some housekeeping things and followed by Q&A. So let's get started. So I said no overview, but just to make sure that people are in the right room, I'm going to explain what UAA is, and then you can figure out whether to stay or not. So the what, why, and the how. So what is UAA? I used to think that it is uh, user authentication and authorization, but when I joined, I was told that it is user account and authentication. So I don't know how that ended up being the name, <laughs> but I tend to refer to it as user authentication and authorization. Um, why do we have it uh, as part of CF? So mainly, initially, when, when the project was kicked off, it was with the intent to secure Cloud Foundry and the different interfaces which make up Cloud Foundry. So there is the Cloud Controller API, and uh, then we have different uh, system components like Diego, Logregator, and the intent was to secure the platform from an authentication and authorization perspective. But over time, we have added features in UAA in order to make it like a first-class service which can be used for securing workloads that run on the platform. It actually doesn't really matter whether workloads run on the platform because uh, we follow standards-based approach to authentication and authorization. So wherever your APIs and apps are running, as long as they trust UAA as their identity server, we can secure it. And how do we do it? So we do this based on open standards. So there have been a lot of standards uh, in the industry around authentication, authorization, and user management. Uh, we chose to stick with the standards listed out here. So there is OAuth for delegated authorization, OpenID Connect for identity single sign-on, SAML, which is also, again, for single sign-on, but it is a much older protocol, LDAP, because we need to. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend securing things with LDAP, but we have to do that for some of our customers. And then finally, SKIM, uh, which is System for Cross-Domain Identity Management. And it comes into play uh, when you are using um, identities which are internal to UAA and how users are onboarded to UAA. So let's get into the feature updates. Uh, some of these things have been uh, like were added to the product a long time back. Uh, but uh, we haven't done a lot of blogging around some of the core features, so I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, basically present uh, the latest feature updates. So starting off with OpenID Connect enhancements. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but UAA is an OpenID Connect identity provider. Um, it's similar to how Google supports single sign-on and uh, it supports the OpenID Connect identity provider profile, so does Azure, and now so does UAA. Uh, this was added some time back, but lately what we've added is uh, something called as the discovery support. Now, you might wonder, like, what is this discovery support? What are we discovering here? So if you are familiar with SAML, Anytime uh, you are onboarding a SAML identity provider, there are two ways in which you can onboard the identity provider. One is by just providing the metadata, which is like an XML file, uh, which uh, represents the configuration for your identity provider. The other way is to provide a URL, uh, which um, if you hit the URL, you can basically uh, get the latest of uh, the identity provider configuration. So on those lines, um, OIDC or OpenID Connect also supports a discovery profile through which you can download the latest metadata and you can discover information about the identity provider. So with respect to UAA, it is available at uh, login system domain well-known configuration for OIDC. Uh, and 
as with any feature of UAA, this is multi-tenant as well. So uh, if you were to have uh, created like a separate zone for UAA, then that configuration would be available at that subdomain.login system domain. And every identity zone in UAA is essentially an OpenID Connect identity provider. So that's about the identity provider support. Uh, but as with any federation protocol, there is uh, another aspect to it, which is the relying party support, right? So um, from a relying party perspective, what we are doing is for existing OpenID Connect providers out there, we are able to trust the authentication and the claims coming from those providers. So we have tested uh, this integration with Google Azure. We ourselves didn't test Ping, one of the partners did. Actually, foundation members, GE uses Ping heavily, and they were able to test uh, the OpenID connection, uh, sorry, uh, configuration with Ping. So coming to the details of uh, the configuration itself, um, we have support for attribute mappings. Uh, this comes into play especially for uh, custom attributes because OIDC has a standard uh, user schema. So if you look at the um, RFC, you will see that there are the like, standard user attributes. But beyond that, if a provider wants to share custom attributes which need to flow through to the application, so things like uh, you know, like some employee ID or a location of the user. So those kind of things can be mapped to a schema in UAA, which is referred to as an attribute mapping. And it's very valuable for applications wanting to receive that information uh, from, again, like the perspective of just receiving a user profile or to make some downstream uh, authorization decisions. So. Um, we also support something called as mapping external entitlements to UAA scopes. So you all are aware that in UAA, we have this concept of permissions, which are referred to as scopes. And these scopes uh, basically define what uh, the access is to a certain API, or it could be some resource. So what we can do is we can map the entitlements, which is external group memberships, to UAA scopes. So if, uh, suppose you on, uh, onboard Azure and you want to share some external group information, but you want to create a mapping policy which says that if the user is an admin in the Azure directory, then I want to provide this so-and-so UAA scope from an API security perspective, you can do that. Um, we also support persistence uh, for these particular attributes. Now, uh, from an organization perspective, you may not want to create another claims store for users. You want to use like the external provider as the definitive store for user attributes. But there are situations wherein you want to have the applications call back into UAA to load more information about the user. So the, in OpenID Connect, there is an endpoint called the user info endpoint. And if you choose to select persistence for the external claims, then they get persisted in UAA. So if you do not have any stringent compliance considerations around where claims are replicated, you can choose to persist them in UAA as well. Uh, finally, on the relying party side, we also support discovery of external OpenID Connect providers. So similar to how we do discovery when we are an IDP, if we are a relying party, uh, you can specify um, the URL to your OIDC provider, and we can discover the rest of the information. There is no need to specifically say, where is the token key, what is the issuer, what is the token URL to get a token. So it just simplifies the onboarding and the overall sort of like lifecycle management for the provider. Um, future work-wise, what is planned for OIDC is we have good coverage in terms of uh, IDP and relying party profiles. Uh, so we are confident that we can go ahead and get a OIDC certification. Uh, this is a, a program that is run by the OIDC Foundation, uh, basically to certify that UAA supports uh, the OIDC profiles as an identity provider to begin with and will eventually get the relying party certification as well. Okay, this is a heavy slide. I've tried to put a lot on this slide, so let me try to work through everything. Um, so in the open house today, one of the key themes was, okay, I'm using UAA. How do I rotate the keys 
and the different credentials that are present in UAA. So the reality of running an identity server in the enterprise is that you have to manage the life cycle of the keys and the various configurations uh, which are essentially falling under the umbrella of credentials. So with respect to UAA, apart from the user passwords, uh, which are governed by a password policy, and if it is an external user store, then we don't really manage the user password. Apart from that, we have different credentials uh, that UAA is using, either as a consumer. So, uh, so we have client secrets, right? So if you are going to... Um, onboard a OAuth client, you basically uh, generate a secret and that is used for identifying the client. But how do you rotate that secret uh, from, you know, like there, may, there might have been a breach with app data and you need to rotate the secret, but then how do you do that without affecting other instances of the app? So there is a there is an existing model that is used by other providers as well, wherein the old credential continues to function while the new credential is introduced into the system. So with credentials, there are two models, right? You have like a shared secret kind of a model, which is like a client secret, but then you have a async, like a PKI structure as well, wherein you are using the credential for either signing or for encryption. So with respect to shared secrets, what we've done is, uh, with client secrets, we've introduced the concept of having the old secret and the new secret uh, both work in tandem. So if you have multiple instances of the application, the old secret will still continue to function as well as the new secret. And once you are confident that all the app instances have been updated, you can just retire the old secret by basically deleting it uh, from within the client configuration. Now, there will be scenarios wherein you don't want the old secret because it's been compromised and you can do an immediate uh, deletion of it as well. Um, so apart from that, from an asynchronous perspective, we have like uh, the JOT signing keys, right? And the SAML certificates and private keys because UAA is generating tokens and those tokens are being uh, signed uh, with UAA's private key. So how do you rotate something like that? So we have introduced, again, the concept of uh, specifying multiple keys. And basically, you set something called as a active key ID. So active key is used for signing the tokens, uh, whereas all the other keys can potentially be used for validating the tokens. So um, the way the key management is done via the API is we have the identity zone API, which is used for configuring every zone in UAA, including the default zone. So you can use that to set an active key and a list of keys. Um, and you can use the token keys endpoint. So you will see that it's not token key and it is token keys because now we support multiple keys to be, um, uh, to be present, which can be used for validating the token because there may be outstanding tokens which have been signed with the old key which is still, which is not being used actively, but you do not want to uh, have failures on those tokens. Again, in situations wherein there is a breach, you will, uh, you will remove the key immediately, which will cause all the existing tokens uh, to be invalidated. Um, SAML certificates and private keys is pretty much the same uh, model wherein uh, we manage the keys via the Identity Zone API again. And uh, with SAML, again, there are two profiles, right? We have the Identity Provider and the Service Provider Profile. So with respect to the Identity Provider Profile, we have uh, signing the assertions and uh, encrypting the assertions. And from a service provider perspective, we are generating an authentication request which is signed. So we always do signing with the active key, but the, uh, but the other keys are still, um, uh, still there for the uh, relying party or the identity provider to validate uh, the signature of the assertion or the authentication request. Um, What's the future of this? So when I explained all of this, this, we expect the devil operators to do a lot with respect to generating these new credentials and setting them as active. But what are we doing as a platform to make this all easier? So um, we have a new project uh, which has been introduced into incubation. It's Cred Hub. And it is, response, it is going to be responsible for all uh, key management and uh, secret management uh, for the platform. So um, this is something that we are going to integrate at a Bosch layer 
or a Bosch level wherein manifests which are in possession of the keys and the secrets uh, will be, um, the manifests which are in possession will no longer have the actual credential in there, but it will just be a reference to a credential in CredHub. So we have plans to integrate that further, uh, with that further for credential generation and rotation. Okay. Um, token exchange flows is something uh, that we have added um, over the past couple of months. We have added different uh, varieties of it. Um, one is the SAML bearer uh, token flow, and the other one is the JOT bearer. So let me explain to you with a sequence diagram. So, um, so this is going to be a tough to explain, so let me take a stab at it. So suppose you have an external application, and that external application uh, is not using UAA as the identity provider. So it, is, it has another external identity provider that it is using for its single sign-on and API security. If that application has to call into a uh, API, which is secured by UAA, it is not in possession of a token to do so. So the way this use case came to us was via uh, OpenStack um, uh, users who have an existing identity provider, which is Keystone, and they just want to do like an in-place exchange of that token, which is generated by Keystone, and get a get in an exchange, get a token through which they can access the cloud controller API. So typically, if there was a browser in the middle, then all the mediation would happen through the browser, as with SAML, wherein you know, like everything flows through the browser, you get redirected to the identity provider, it generates an assertion, and then you get redirected back to UAA, which in, in turn generates an access token after the assertion is validated. But if you want to do this in a native manner, like script it, it's hard. And that's where token exchange comes into picture. Because with token exchange, there is no need for a browser in the middle. You have an assertion, like uh, identity provider or an external application may be in possession of an assertion uh, or a JOT. And it can exchange it with, in this case, UAA for an access token that can be used for accessing other services. Um, another example is uh, in enterprises, you have to deal with um, applications which are legacy. They are not using the latest and greatest of protocols, right? So uh, if you have an ecosystem of legacy applications and APIs which need to call into the newer sort of cloud native APIs or apps on the platform, then you have to deal with different token formats. So token exchange makes that possible wherein um, you have an older format token, you send it to UAA, and then that gives you an access token that you can use to access apps and APIs protected by UAA. So uh, from, uh, from a standards perspective, there is an RFC for it. Those are the two RFCs. Uh, but it goes beyond just token exchange. Um, another thing that we plan on adding is uh, the JOT bearer for client authentication. Uh, now, it sounds a bit cryptic, but basically what it is uh, is today UAA supports uh, client secrets for authentication, right? So any time a client has to identify itself to UAA, uh, it uses a secret, and based on that, we, uh, we match the hash and say that, okay, this client is valid. But uh, imagine, again, in like IoT kind of a situation wherein devices have already been uh, provisioned with certificates, right? That's their identity. So typically, like with asset management, what you do is that you have devices which are tied to a cert as an identity, and you do not want to add another secret to the mix, right? Because then you have to deal with the life cycle of that client's secret. So with the JOT bearer for client authentication, every client uh, which follows this model will be able to identify itself using its cert. So it can basically sign an assertion which validates its identity or which proves its identity as opposed to having a client secret as having to you know, like present a client secret. So uh, enterprises where there is heavy use of you know, like provisioning certs for assets, and they need to do a basic, um, what should I say, a token acquisition flow, they can use the existing cert as the identity rather than using the secret. Um, 
So opaque and revocable token support um, with, with this. So out of the box, UAA today uh, supports JWT-based uh, tokens, right? Um, basically, JWT tokens are things that can be validated offline, but we added an additional token format called as uh, the opaque token. So the question is, this just leads to more confusion. Like there is already so much confusion with how to use OAuth and then we dump like two more token formats on you and then you think, okay, oh my God, what am I trying to do? Which token format should I use? So uh, some, um, you know, like this table is to sort of clear some of that confusion. So uh, Jot by nature can be validated offline. Uh, the reason why Jot exists is because um, it, with distributed systems, offline validation works much better, and it just reduces the number of network calls that you have to make for validating tokens. Um, but same is not the case with opaque tokens, but they exist for a reason. And the reason is um, you may have requirements around um, not having the clients actually be able to read what is in the token. So I'll give you an example. So in OAuth, right, you have a resource server, you have a client, and you have the authorization server. Whenever a app needs to call into an API, it requests an access token from UAA. But if you're using Jot, then the client actually has the knowledge of what's in the token. You may have situations where you don't want the client to know what is in the token. It's only meant for the resource server. Now, you can solve it with something like encrypting the token itself, but uh, the way we have done this or implemented this is using an opaque token wherein uh, it's like a string. It's an opaque string. Uh, it does not actually mean anything to the client, but client is supposed to just pass it to uh, the UAA, which will tell it what is actually in the token. So if you want to maintain claims confidentiality, you should use an opaque token. Um, it's, so opaque tokens by nature are persisted, but you can do the same with JWT also. So the question is, why would you want to uh, persist JOTs when they, they are validated offline? Uh, the, the reason is, um, if you are having you know, like highly privileged flows within an application, so not all applications are created equal, right? Like you, you have applications which are meant for uh, privileged access, right? And the kind of operations that are performed within the application are privileged. In those scenarios, you want always the latest state of what the user permissions are, which only the uh, SDS or the token server can tell you. So in those situations, you can either use JWT, which is persisted, or you can use an opaque token because we have the ability to always give you the latest state of a user or a client permission. Um, future work-wise, what we want to do in this area is, uh, from a configuration perspective, uh, you can you can request opaque tokens on a per client basis, but we don't enforce it. It's something that you do at request time. Uh, and coming to uh, JWTs being revocable, that is something that you can do on a zone or an identity zone basis. So we want to give uh, more configuration, um, what should I say, bandwidth around that, wherein you can, you can configure the token formats on a user-client combination, and you can also enforce token formats at a client level. Um, so when I was creating this slide, I was like, I do not know how our customers understand which library to use for UAA. So <laughs> this is to clear out some of that confusion. Um, so from a client side integration perspective, um, so UAA is implementing all of the server side flows, right? But on the client side, how do you integrate with UAA? So we have UAAC, and, uh, which is essentially a Ruby uh, gem, and it is backed by a Ruby library, which is the CF UAA lib. And it's, uh, I consider UAAC to be more of an admin tool, which is used for um, basically admin flows in UAA, like onboarding users, managing uh, clients, managing providers. So that's something which we have in maintenance mode right now. And um, Spring Security OAuth is, uh, a developer-focused sort of like an integration um, uh, library 
for UAA. Uh, I say developer focused because it deals with the OAuth client configuration. So if you want to integrate an application with UAA, you can use something like Spring Security OAuth and you get that integration. And there is no need to write any native code for integrating with UAA. Um, you should know that we have a rewrite planned. Uh, it's not something that is maintained by the UAA team. Uh, it is maintained by Spring Security. But the kind of rewrite that we are planning is, um, so if you are aware of Spring Boot, uh, there, are, uh, there is a lot of OAuth capabilities which have found their way into Spring Boot. So we are trying to create like a clean separation between uh, OAuth uh, in um, OAuth implementation and what is in Spring Boot. So that's why the rewrite is happening. Um, we also have a CF Java client. Again, uh, this is uh, not just for UAA because it's for also, by the name, it's also for the Cloud Controller API. Uh, but it also provides you all of the latest uh, API support for UAA. So anytime we add new uh, APIs to UAA, there is a corresponding CF Java client version also which supports those things. Um, we recently introduced a singular SDK. It is a it is a client-side SDK for UAA in JavaScript. So this is something that we did for some of our internal projects, but it's definitely something that you can use with uh, your single page apps as well. And we have plans to add support for Node.js. Uh, and finally, uh, we announced this big partnership with Microsoft and moving a lot of .NET workloads over to the platform. And uh, there is definitely a gap in terms of UAA not having some de facto .NET SDK. So that is something that uh, we'll focus on. OK, so I tried to cover some amount of roadmap within the feature updates. But there is a separate roadmap as well. So bear with me. Um, so we are planning to add uh, multi-factor authentication. And uh, this is basically, um, if you're aware of multi-factor authentication, there are different providers out there. There is uh, Google Authenticator, which is widely used. And uh, there are other things like Ubico, Authy, uh, and Tofer. So we are going to start with Google Authenticator integration. And uh, I think the key takeaway uh, for you should be how we are going to accomplish this integration. We are going to do this at two levels. One is to enable multi-factor authentication for the entire identity zone. That means a user is not considered authenticated if they don't complete a uh, two-factor authentication. So if you basically don't use the code from your Google Authenticator app, you are not considered authenticated, and you won't be able to access anything beyond that. Um, we also want to do something called as step-up authentication, where, wherein um, instead of enabling it for the entire uh, authentication domain or identity zone, you can enable multi-factor authentication per app. So uh, a typical use case could be that you have certain applications which, again, are dealing with privileged access, and you want uh, those applications to prompt for multi-factor authentication, but not necessarily every app out there uh, from a usability perspective. So depending on your compliance and security requirements, you can enable the multi-factor authentication policy. Uh, finally, on the multi-factor authentication, it's not just from an authentication perspective. Uh, typically, you will see that you know anytime you're trying to reset a credential, uh, you're prompted for a second factor because you're, again, performing a privileged action for your account. So we have plans to uh, integrate that flow into something like a password reset for UAA, wherein if you're trying to reset a user's password in UAA uh, as a user, that is, as an end user flow, then you're going to be prompted for a second factor. Um, Fine-grained authorization service, I think it's, it's been on the back burner for a very long time. Um, so there are some very specific uh, CF platform needs that are driving uh, the need for an authorization service, a fine-grained authorization service. Um, today, we have some gaps around how uh, fine-grained authorization is done on the platform. So we have canned roles of space developer and org manager in CF, and you cannot go beyond them. You cannot split those roles into low-level sort of uh, resource actions and permissions. Another uh, sort of like a gap is the ability to map those CF roles 
to your existing enterprise entitlements. So this is something that we have heard from a lot of customers, both on open source and on the commercial front, is uh, how do I derive something like a space developer role from an existing LDAP entitlement? So those those two needs um, are becoming you know like really evident and uh, a major gap in terms of our uh, identity management strategy with the platform, and we plan on addressing those. Um, but beyond that, there are new services that are being continually added to the ecosystem. So there is CredHub, which is performing a lot of, which is going to be performing a lot of credential actions which are privileged, and you want to um, secure it at that level. Not coarse grain, but fine grained authorization, potentially at like a credential level, and other CF services. So so uh, definitely there is a need for like a common service. Uh, now the question is whether it's going to be part of UAA or it's going to be a separate service. So um, this is something that we have not still decided on, uh, but we've definitely decided on building a service. So whether it is part of UAA or not is, is, is immaterial. Um, coming to some of the other architectural aspects, um, we plan on following like a access control list approach or an ACL approach, wherein every resource has a um, has a um, ACL, uh, which contains multiple entries per user, um, multiple entries with each for uh, a, a user or a group. So we have plans to follow that kind of a model for uh, fine grained authorization and. Uh, Delegation is something which is uh, key to fine-grained authorization. So by delegation, I mean, so if I, as a user, want to delegate some permissions out to another user or a client, uh, but only do so on um, like a selective basis. I don't want to delegate all of my rights, so that's essentially impersonation, but I just want to delegate like a subset of the rights. I should be able to do that. And then finally, as with UAA, uh, which secures not just the platform, but apps on the platform. We want to do this for the service as well, wherein it's not just meant for securing um, the CF platform, but we want to extend it for applications and APIs too. So if applications and APIs have fine-grained authorization requirements, then you should be able to use this service. Um, there are some other features that we are actively working on. One of them is uh, performance testing. So uh, in the morning, uh, Eric touched upon how in Diego they've done some uh, performance testing uh, to basically create like scaling indicators. We plan to do the same thing with UAA. And uh, we plan to integrate it into like a CI uh, system because we don't want to regress on uh, our uh, performance indicators. So. That's something uh, that is a track of work that the team is actively invested in. And then we are doing some major documentation revamp as well. Um, one of the things that has been challenging lately is to keep up on the UAA Slack channel with all the questions that we keep getting around, you know, like, oh, what is OAuth? How do you onboard X provider, Y provider? So there's definitely a lack of documentation uh, on the product front, and we plan to sort of, you know, like, uh, solve that in a persona based approach wherein we are planning to have like an operator guide and a developer guide. Uh, we recently revamped our API documentation, by the way. So uh, we have like a, a standard. API doc set right now, as opposed to something living in GitHub. Uh, we plan to also have identity provider integration guides. So this is another area where we've been we've lacked a bit in terms of keeping up with all the integration guides. Um, finally, there are there are other things that we are doing around account management, which is account linking, uh, which is the ability to link account across identity providers and uh, Skim 2.0 support. So UAA today supports Skim 1.1. Uh, but lately, there has been a lot of enterprise adoption around uh, 2.0, and most uh, enterprise identity systems are supporting SCIM 2.0 connectors. So that's something that we'll look to. OK. So this is the penultimate slide, I believe, probably on time. Um, housekeeping. So 
uh, there are a few things which I always uh, wanted to sort of discuss in this kind of a group is how to uh, how can UAA project updates be tracked. So uh, UAA project updates are part of the uh, Elastic Runtime PMC. So PMC stands for Project Management Council, and uh, we have a biweekly meeting that happens. So this is purely like this is open source. It's not related just to Pivotal or anything. So this happens for all of um, all of the projects which are part of Cloud Foundry and UA falls under Elastic Runtime. And uh, you can find the notes on uh, what are the recent tracks of work um, that are uh um, you know, like in progress, and uh, what we will be working on next, you know, like spread over at least like a month or so. So you can find that notes, uh, and I've linked it there. It's under Cloud Foundry PMC notes. And uh, a note on UA security issues as well. Lately, uh, there has been a trend sometimes on you know like security issues being reported to GitHub. Um, I would recommend that anytime you have a security issue, please email security at pivotal.io. We have a proper workflow in place right now, and um, through which issues that come in, all the security issues that come in, are uh, vetted with the product team, with the security team, and they are given a CVSS score. And then we basically uh, decide how to patch uh, the different UA versions. So please use that model. And uh, CVs now are pu being published under Cloud Foundry org uh, under the security um, a folder. So previously it was on Pivotal IO, but now all of the CVs which are related to Cloud Foundry projects are all under Cloud Foundry org security. So you can get more details there as well. Um, finally, before we go to Q&A, um, I want to take a moment to thank the entire identity team. Um, everything that we have done in the past, I would say, couple of years wouldn't have been possible without an amazing team. And uh, during the keynote, uh, we talked about uh, balanced teams and how diversity plays a major role. I mean, I'm proud to say that the UA team is highly diverse from a gender perspective, nationalities, and also from all the different companies that we work for. So that is, that is the current identity team, because at Pivotal, we rotate people a lot. But that is what uh, the team is today. So Bharat from GE. Uh, I have a few people in the room, Philip, uh, Helen, <laughs> Jeremy, and uh, Jen, uh, Mikhail from VMware, Priyata. Uh, I'm the PM, and we recently had a new PM join, Tian. Thank you. <laughs> for coming on board. Um, that's it. Questions? Oh, sure. Sorry. So, it's not necessarily a UA integration, but more of a platform integration. So the initial phase is going to be the integration of uh, CredHub with everything Bosch related in terms of generation of credentials. So uh, that's something that will uh, show up uh, soon. Uh, from a pivotal perspective, it's going to show up in the next version. Yeah, uh, but this is again, you know, like we are going to take a phased approach to introducing or moving credentials into CredHub. So uh, we are going to introduce the dependency of uh, a CredHub server on the Bosch director, and then we will eventually move uh, the credentials. There is another um, phase in which all of the um, credentials which are part of like VCAP services. So at an app layer, if you're managing credentials under environment variables, those are also things that will eventually move into CredHub. Yes? Um, I don't, um, I don't have much insight into uh, the decision making there because it's a separate team. Um, which uh, deals with the architectural, uh, you know, like aspects of CredHub. Uh, but I do know that uh, with Spring, uh, we we do have integration with Vault. So on on the client side. Is, is there a way to make the assignment of users of apps a single step process as opposed to two step process? 
So that's something that we will be able to achieve with uh, entitlement mappings. So if you have an external identity provider and you already have a certain you know, like group membership, we will be able to map it to a space role or an org role. Um, so right now it is two-step because you have to create a user in UAA which represents that external identity and then you provision that user with more roles. But uh, when we have this uh, entitlement mapping, there is no need for you to pre-provision the user. You can just create a mapping which gives them the right access. So this is something that AWS does as well, wherein um, you can just map you know, like an existing external group membership to an AWS role. Yes. Some of that mapping is uh, particular to a given space. Um, so what's to prevent if you have multiple IDPs? Like how do you specify the mapping is for or if it is particularly tied to that IDP if there's no connection between that IDP and that So um, the mappings themselves are IDP specific. So if, if you create a mapping uh, for a certain uh, group membership, external group membership, it will come into play only if you're authenticating via that IDP. Yeah, but what's, what's to I mean, definitely, there. From a workflow perspective, you have to take uh, take into account, uh, you know, like how those mappings will be done around across those identity providers because it's going to be a privileged operation. So you cannot have that kind of duplication. Yes. Yes. That that will have to be. Um, yeah, but there has to be certain level of trust. Okay, I think uh, we've probably 10 minutes over. Okay, thank you.